Well, greetings, NASA 65, 66 test takers. Dean Tinney coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. I know how many people on the channel love practice questions and practice tests. So I have 60 uh, additional practice questions for 65 and 66 that I'll be explicating and putting in both those uh, playlists. Um, kudos, shout out to Kaplan. Uh, if you don't have a Kaplan QBank, it is the best paid supplement to your primary study materials. Your best uh, free supplement is my YouTube channel. But uh, Kaplan allows my viewers, subscribers, and members of our Reddit community to get a free look at Kaplan questions like this. If you'd like to add the uh, Kaplan QBank, uh, you can do so with my Guru10 discount code. It's uh, about 60 bucks. Uh, Brian Lee, Test Geek Exam Prep LLC, is also working on another, uh, I think, 110 questions for 66. Uh, he's been very happy with our collaboration. He wants to further that, so he's working on some additional content. So you could be looking for uh, 110 more questions as uh, well in or, here in the near future. All right, well, let's get started on the explication. Uh, number one, which of the following is most suitable investment for the individual retirement account of a young couple with a combined annual income of 42,000. So keywords here in terms of suitability is that they're a young couple. So their time horizon seems to me that it would be quite long. And if you have a longer term time horizon, you can afford to be a little more aggressive. Now, we don't wanna be so aggressive that we're gonna put IPOs of small companies. IPOs are in themselves, uh, you know, aggressive and then small companies even more aggressive, right? So B doesn't seem like to be suitable. Options, absolutely not. Partnerships, no. Partnerships are illiquid and there's already tax advantages uh, associated with them. So uh, let me get out my annotation tool here. And we're gonna say the answer is A. Number two. The Investment Company Act of 1940 includes several different types of entities in its definition of an investment company. Among them is the management company, which is further classified as either open-ended or closed-end. Listen, test takers, you're going to get tormented on the differences between open-ended and closed-end funds. I have a whole entire separate lecture on it. I have a mutual fund lecture on it. You need to get this down. This could be three, four, five questions on both 65 and 66. Anyways, uh, although there are a number of similarities, professional management diversification, for example. One characteristic of an open-ended investment company that distinguishes it from a closed-end investment company is that, A, it may avoid taxation by distributing all of its net investment income to shareholders. Remember, they're asking us well, how they're different, and that's not how they're different. Uh, B, it may be either diversified or non-diversified. No, they can, that's not true. C, there's a, there we go, ding, 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 C. There is a continuous public offering. That is not true of a closed-end fund. A closed-end fund is a one-time IPO and then it trades in the secondary market. So that's just one distinction. That means not only does the investment company have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940, it also is gonna to have to comply with 33. So the answer to number two is C is in Charlie. C is in Charlie. Number three, very testable. In certain situations, the certain situation here is a safe harbor under 33 called Reg D. So in a Reg D, that's the situation. A private placement, key point, a private placement, an investment by invitation only, requires an investor to meet the definition of a credit investor. Under which of the following circumstances would an investor be considered accredited? Now, a good way to remember this is one, two, three. To be an accredited investor, one, they need to have a million dollars, exclusive of their primary residence and net worth. That's the one. Two, if they're individual, they got to have make $200,000 for the last two years with the expectation of $200,000 this year. Or if they're married and filing jointly, three hundred dollars for the last two years with the expectation of three hundred dollars this year. Uh, again, you know, the assumption here is that they can protect their own interest or rent somebody who can do it for them. Now, be very, very careful, test takers, this is nothing to do with the Uniform Securities Act. This definition only means, can I extend an invitation to participate in a Reg D private placement? Uh, one, absolutely not. Uh, excuse me, A. Uh, B, 200,000, 100,000, nope. C, 
a million dollars net worth exclusive primary residence and uh, 200,000 annual income. Well, given that answer set, that is indeed our best answer. So the answer to three is C. Number four, Whoop. I'm going to go back. Under the Uniform Securities Act, which of the following statements regarding a sale or an offer? doesn't matter. I think of this, whether it's an offer not accepted or offer accepted a sale, it's a transaction. And what they're asking here about is the jurisdiction of the Uniform Securities Act, or does it, uh, you know, does it uh, fall under the jurisdiction of the Uniform Securities Act? That's what number four is saying in English. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that one of the challenges on these NASA exams they're in such legalese that, you know, it's hard to figure out what you're being asked. Now, once you figure out what you're being asked, uh, then it becomes a little easier. Uh, by the way, the questions I'm pulling here from if you join me for a three or four day 65, 66 class, and these questions are also found in the uh, Kaplan QBank if you uh, purchase the QBank as well. We try and pull those if we have time in class to do some questions. On the Uniform Securities Act, which of the long statements regarding sale or offer sale? Let's look at number one. Any security given or delivered with, with or as a bonus for any purchase, there's the key word, purchase, consideration. You know, this is a legal test. Sometimes I have attorneys say, Dean, if I don't pass this thing, it's going to be embarrassing. I say, absolutely, because, you know, if anybody should get the rules and regs and understand the legal age, it should probably be an attorney. Number two, be very careful. Number two. Number two, accessible is the key word there. If this said non-accessible, three letters would change this answer. But uh, the state administrator, you know, the state administrator is the equivalent of the SEC on the state level. I think of the SEC is God and state administrators think they are. And so, you know, there's these 50 demigods, demigods running around. Anyways, the state administrator uh, doesn't care about non-accessible stock, but he doesn't care about accessible stock where there's a potential for capital calls. Again, I'm not a lecture, an explication. Just make sure when you're doing questions, you're reading very carefully. A gift of non-accessible stock would not be considered an offer sale. A gift of accessible stock is. We need one and two. Now, good news, there's only one answer set here that gives us both one and two in the same answer set. So I'm kind of done as a test taker. Let's see what three is. Maybe I didn't know three, but now three is going to be uh, you know, free information that perhaps I can use elsewhere. Every sale or offer Warner stock with a right to purchase subscribe to another security is considered to include an offer of the other security. Yes, rights and warrants, absolutely. So three. And then you should definitely know, <coughs> no, excuse, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna kill the recording here for a little bit. Uh, okay, I think I live, I'm alive. <laughs> Anyways, uh, number four is very testable. A bona fide pledge is considered an offer sale. That's not true. A bona fide pledge is Latin. Bona fide is, means bona is good, fide is faith. And if I'm pledging securities as collateral to you, my lender, and you, the lender, foreclose on me, I don't meet my responsibility, and you sell the securities, you don't need to worry about that. So you should definitely know that four is not a bona fide pledge of securities. Definitely no gift of accessible stock is. So the answer is A. Number five, which of the following would qualify under Section 28E safe harbor provision? Safe harbor is a legal term. I'd get comfortable with that term because, you know, whenever you're talking to an attorney and you say, are there any safe harbors, you're asking, is there a way to do what you want to do without getting into legal trouble? And I always use the example of my brother. My brother's involved in uh, legal cannabis and there are safe harbors that he's, are available to him and some that are not. So you got to ask an attorney, what are the safe harbors? Now, remember, soft dollar compensation is compensation paid by a broker or dealer to an investment advisory firm that directs trades to them. As a broker dealer, we love investment advisory clients because they, uh, you know, we make a lot of money from them. So what am I allowed to help them pay for? So soft dollar means I'm not gonna pay the investment advisory firm directly. What I'm gonna do is help them help their clients because the clients of the investment advisory firm are also clients of my broker dealer. So you should definitely know that we can't uh, help you with rent. So you should definitely know that rent is prohibited. Uh, providing access to the broker dealer's computerized accounting system, allowing the investment advisor to prepare its financial statements. Now, I'm not quite sure how B helps my broker dealer clients, which are the investment advisory clients, 
that sounds like primarily what I'm doing there is helping the investment advisor. The way I think of it is I, I can help the investment advisor help their clients, which is my clients too. See, clearance and settlement of services provided by the broker dealer. Yeah, so that's exactly uh, what this is all about. So that's what qualifies for the soft dollar compensation. And you should definitely know travel's out. So you should know rent is out, travel is out, furniture is out. So make sure you know not so much what soft dollars can be used for. In this example, what they can be used for is a C, but main, mainly no, no rent and no travel expenses. So that's the main thing to know. So five is C is in Charlie, C is in Charlie. All right, so let's look at number six. Uh, the Uniform Securities Act requires client consent for the assignment of investment advisory contracts. That's very testable. You definitely should know that. In all the following situations except, now you gotta be careful on the accepts. So we're looking for something that is, uh, doesn't require consent. The A, the sole owner of an investment advisory firm pledges the firm as collateral for a bank loan. Well, if I'm the sole owner and I pledge that as collateral and I don't fulfill my responsibilities, they're gonna liquidate or sell my investment advisory practice. And that would be what we call a change in control. And so A is definitely something that's gonna require client consent. I say, hey, listen, Mr. Client, I'm pledging my investment advisory firm for this loan. Uh, B, the sole proprietor of an investment advisory firm sells the firm to another advisor. Now you should not be struggling with that one. That one's pretty straightforward as you know, assignment goes. I mean, the successor firm, right? So B is pretty straightforward as this test goes. The death of a partner holding a minority interest. So that's the key word there, minority interest. No change in the ownership interest of the remaining partner. So that means the minority partner interest is just being transferred to another minority partner. That is not change in control. The same majority partners were still in charge of this business. So C is the answer to this one, C. But let's see, you do, by the way, just make sure, you know, one of the things I always tell you, RTFQ, read the full answer and also read the full answer set. Now there's a couple of reasons I'm still gonna read choice D as in dog, uh, just to see if it's not perhaps a best answer, RTFQ, but also RTFA, read the full answer set. You know, because sometimes they are allowed to give you a right answer that can be marked wrong, but it's not the best answer. So I just wanna look at D and see, okay, is it better than C? The other reason I wanna look at it is because it's free information. You know, maybe I didn't know D and now I do, right? If I'm taking C and not D, then D is truthful. Maybe I can use that. Two investment advisory firms intend to merge, causing a change in the majority interest. Nope, that's pretty straightforward. That does indeed uh, require consent. So the answer here is C, C. Now, uh, I wish you get more aim and shoot point and click questions than you do. You know, aim and shoot point and click are just recognition questions, things you just simply know or you don't. And you can't be giving up recognition questions. So under the Uniform Securities Act, an agent may file for a review of an administrator's revocation order within how many days of the revocation? It's 60. That's 60 days. And so, you know, I hope that when you're doing these practice questions that I put on the channel for you, that you have a four by six deck of flashcards where things like this, you can make a flashcard as you're watching, or you have your notes where you can, you know, make sure you're not noting these things down, right? So the answer is 60 days. Number eight, securities by which of the following, securities by which of the following are exempt from registration and advertising filing requirements on the Uniform Securities Act. You should not be struggling at all with the United States or any territory of the United States government being an exempt issuer. No, exempt issuer means you don't have to make registrations. The only type of security that an exempt issuer can give birth to is an exempt security. So number one, shouldn't have been struggling with number one. By the way, number one gives you a 50-50 because now in the answer set, you only have choice A and D that have one in it. And that means we're taking three because three is, I have to take it if I'm taking one. So you might've been struggling, but you can't be struggling that too. You do definitely know state or political subdivisions. Those are municipal issuers. I'm coming to you from Las Vegas, Nevada. The state of Nevada is a municipal issuer of securities. I'm coming to you from Las Vegas, Clark County. Las Vegas is a political subdivision of Clark County, and Clark County is a political subdivision of Nevada. And you should definitely know that municipal issuers are exempt from registration on the Uniform Securities Act. Well, now that we know we're taking two, we know we're going to be taking three. A common carrier is a transportation company. 
And when, you know, we set up the template for the Uniform Securities Act, it's actually more than one template that's been revised, but who cares? It's not that they got a free pass, it's that they typically answer to what was called at the time the Interstate Commerce Commission. And same thing for banks. It's not that banks get a free pass, it's that banks answer to different regulatory authorities, not the state administrator either. If it's a state chartered bank, the State Banking Commission, or if it's a uh, federally chartered bank, FDIC, Federal Reserve Board. So the answer to number eight is D. D is in dot. Number nine. Uh, which of the following statements would justify an administrator's denial of a securities registration? So number nine, it's in the public interest. It's in the public interest. Absolutely. That's what you know the state administrator is doing. It's you know, got to be an and, by the way. It can't just be public interest. The state administrator has got to say it's in the public interest and. So we need one and something else. The company has not been paying dividends. No, there's all kinds of companies that don't pay dividends. You know, dividends or not are a decision of the board of directors. And so too is nonsensical in that regard. I mean, you know, they don't revoke registrations because, you know, companies don't pay dividends. That depends on the type of company. The underwriter's compensation is accepted. It's ding, 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 ding. You know, sometimes the state administrator says, listen, I think you could make that a little bit more, you know, sometimes we say dirt in the ground, so to speak, and less into the offering expenses. So definitely one in three, one in three. Uh, number 10, which of the following statements regarding both traditional and Roth IRAs, both traditional and Roth IRAs are uh, true, is true. Uh, contributions, contributions are deductible. Well, I know it says Roth and IRAs, and that's not true or Roth. In a Roth, you're using after-tax money. Withdrawals at retirement are tax-free. Well, that's not true of the traditional IRA. They're going to be taxed at ordinary income. Uh, earnings on investments are not taxed during the accumulation uh, period. Yes, that is true of both Roths and traditional IRAs. So the answer to number 10 is C, as in Charlie. Number 11, which of the following are neither an offer nor a sale according to the Uniform Securities Act? Neither an offer nor a sale. In other words, what we're saying here is which of these have no jurisdiction uh, under the Uniform Securities Act? Reclassification of the issuer securities. Now, what does that mean in English? For example, Facebook used to be called Facebook and now it's called Meta. And so Facebook has reclassified its common stock as being common stock in uh, Facebook to now being stock in what's called Meta, which is the holding company that owns Facebook. That is not subject to the Uniform Securities Act. That's considered a reclassification of the issuer's securities. So we definitely need one. Two, uh, bonafide pledge or loan. You should definitely know that. That's definitely high risk on your exam. So remember, if I'm a lender, and you pledge to me as securities as collateral for the loan, and you don't pay me, I can uh, sell those securities without worrying about running afoul of the Uniform Securities Act. Now, bona fide just means, again, good faith. It means a traditional kind of a loan where I went through the loan approval process. You know, there's nothing, no shenanigans involved there. Uh, three is very testable. An act incident incidental. So number three, Roman number three is also pretty testable. An act incident to a judicially approved reorganization. Now, what does that mean in English? That means chapter seven or chapter 11. Uh, chapter seven is a liquidation of a, a corporation. Chapter 11 is reorganization of a corporation. But in the bankruptcy process, the judge is going to appoint a trustee to you know, be in charge of the corpus. Don't you love that? The body, the corporation and bankruptcy. Now, a lot of times in bankruptcy, securities are going to be exchanged. In a lot of bankruptcies, for example, the creditors are going to agree to accept equity, you know, to extinguish their claim in bankruptcy. So number three is uh, absolutely true. That is high risk. So just remember when you hear the word judicially approved reorganization, what that means is bankruptcy. And that means exchange of securities in the bankruptcy process. And uh, that's not subject to the jurisdiction of the Uniform Securities Act. So we have uh, one, we have two, uh, we now have uh, three. Let's see what four says. A stock dividend of stock other than the issuers, key point, of which nothing of value was given. So in legalese, what that means is no consideration. 
And so the answer 11 is D, one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. Number 12. Which of the following are not investment advisors according to the SEC release IA 1092? So, you know, there were people who were saying, oh, I don't think I'm an investment advisor. And the SEC said, really? Well, what are you doing? Remember, the definition is, do you give investment advice? Do you tell people you're in the business of giving investment advice? And do you want compensation? And, you know, what this was really about was, you know, uh, you know financial planners primarily. So uh, which of the following are not investment advisors according to the release IA 1092? Number 12. Uh, a broker-dealer who charges for investment advice. Well, if a broker-dealer wants to charge for investment advice uh, as a fee, they're going to have to set up, a, set up an affiliated investment advisory firm. And so it's not one. Publisher of financial newspaper. You know, uh, I got into a little bit with somebody in my social media, and he said, you're uh, putting links that uh, require subscriptions and, you know, is that always the case? I guess he maybe thinks I'm getting some kind of kickback from the Wall Street Journal or New York Times. And I said, well, no, I, I post links to articles that I think are germane to your test taking and not worried about your subscription. But P.S., if you're going to be in our business, you probably should consider subscribing, which made him matter. I mean, you know, you should probably have a, a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. Now, uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, let's pick the Wall Street Journal, does give investment advice. But they're not charging for it. I don't pay. I don't forget what I paid ten bucks a month for my Wall Street Journal. And I have great columns in there and uh, some great stuff. But it, that's not their business. They're a general circulation financial newspaper, so they are not considered an investment advisor. Number twelve. So two, a person who sells securities analysis. Well, that sounds like they're getting a char, uh, getting some compensation for that. Uh, a CPA are not investment advisors. A uh, CPA who is an incidental part of his practice. Now, that's, again, a very important word for your own test. So, you know, uh, a good way to remember this is late lawyers, accountants, teachers, and engineers. So, you know, if you're a lawyer, an accountant is the accountant, teacher, or engineer, and you give investment advice, but it's incidental. So I'm your CPA. I said, hey, listen, uh, you've been pretty blessed. You're in a very high tax bracket, and uh, you might want to consider some munis. Now, key point, I'm not going to be making a markup or markdown or commission when you do that. And so the answer number 12 is two and four, two and four. Or the key word, by the way, make sure. Now, you know, Chuck uh, Lowenstein is the subject matter expert at CAP and he's in charge of these uh, Q bank and questions. And, uh, you know, with love, I say he's a bigger jerk than the real jerks. He's purposely trying to make these questions a little tougher grammar wise, because that's what people, you know, give feedback on is they're tough. And so what I mean by that is that not is embedded in the middle of a sentence, uh, you know, that makes it tougher. You know, usually it would be at the end and it would say accept. So for what it's worth. All right, number 13, uh, the term investment advisor representative. Now, if I were you, every time I heard the term investment advisor representative, I'd say, oh, that's me. I'm an investment advisor representative. When you pass your 65 or 66, and you know, you probably see this on the channel every once in a while, please, you know, I like people tell me what happened to them. And, you know, a lot of times people say, hey, I just passed my 65, 66. And for most, that's the last leg in their testing journey. And then I say, hey, kudos, investment advisor representative, because that's what you are now is an investment advisor representative. So it includes which of the following and a receptionist for the advisor. So if my receptionist, if he's just the guy answering the phone, and says, hey, thanks for calling Gamma Global Investment Advisors. Doesn't need to take him past a 65, 66. An employee of an investment advisor, that's going to be you. Right? You're taking a 65, 66 to solicit new business. Well, maybe not. Maybe you work in the back office, for example. But I, the test assumes that, right? So test assumes that's what you're doing. That's, you know, so ride the horse in the direction it's going. We need two. We need two. Uh, a supervisor who oversees employees that manage client portfolios or an advisor, absolutely. So two and three, it looks like our answer here is going to be B. Uh, two and three, where's two and three? Oh, my, my bad, C, C is in Charlie, C is in Charlie. Now be careful, the investment advisory firm you know, in your own brain housing group, you got to be work at really keeping straight about when I'm asking you about an unnatural person, a broker dealer or an investment advisory firm, 
not living, breathing human beings watching planet Earth. And when I'm asking, asking about agents or broker dealers or in this question, investment advisor representatives, those are living, breathing human beings walking planet Earth. That would be you with a 65, 60, uh, 66, or if you're an agent of a broker dealer, that would be your six, your seven. So uh, make sure you, you, know, you pay attention to that. Uh, 14, a uh, customer placed an order with an agent to sell 100 shares of ABC. So key thing here I'm looking for is the action, buy or sell, there's the action, sell. 100 shares, so there's the uh, uh, quantity, the amount. ABC, there's the asset. So the three A's are present, action, asset, amount. And he instructed the agent to limit any losses. So far, so good. The agent does not have discretionary authority over, over the count. So the key point in this, and let's just get our thing out here. This is very important on the exam. Is if I don't have discretionary authority on the account, I can't make a decision about action, asset, and amount. So that's really kind of an important phraseology there. I could, don't need discretionary authority about time and price. So, so far, there's no problem in the question because, you know, uh, he told me to action, asset, amount. The agent waited to sell the securities, hoping to get a better price. So I'm trying to get my customer a good time and price. That's called execution. The price of the shares went down. So the agent sold 50 shares. No, no, no. They love these questions where it sounds like your heart's in the right spot, but you still have a violated, you know, the rule. So even if your intentions are good, you're still in trouble here because you're not supposed to make a decision about action, asset, or amount. So uh, you should definitely know this is a violation. So we have two that say it's a violation. It, what a says it's a violation because the agent acted without discretionary authority. That is true. That is true. Let's see what C says just to see if perhaps that's not a better answer. A violation because the agent is required to execute sell. No, that's not true. As I just said, we do have, uh, we can make uh, decisions about time and price for clients without discretionary authority. Uh, by the way, if you're a 65 and you need to brush up on that, I uh, would go to the, the channel and there's a whole lecture on types of orders. And if, you know, if you're a tabula rasa blank slate, meaning you don't have any background in the securities industry and you're taking a 65, you know, maybe you need to power up on that. You know, if you're a seven, you took your, your seven two weeks ago. I'm joking, but maybe you did. Uh, but that's the same, by the way, if you're a six, perhaps a uh, 63, maybe you want to brush up. There's lots of narrative lectures. Uh, you know, if there's a certain subject area you feel you need to do some work on. Uh, 15, under the Uniform Securities Act, under the Uniform Securities Act, all the following secure statements are true except. So we are looking for something that is false. We're looking for something that's false. Now, sometimes what I like to do, let me just get on my annotation tool. I like to put uh, true or false next to that. Uh, by the way, that's just my little egg timer going off. And so what I like to do, let me just... Uh, stop share here real quick. Uh, I like to give you a 30 minute interval. If you want to take a break, you can hit pause and, uh, you know, come back to it. These uh, explications come in pretty long. You know, I try and mix it up between short lectures, long lectures, and I try and have something every week for people. This is going to be a longer one. So this is a 30 minute break. If you want to take it, I'm going to continue to march on. But if you'd like to take a break, now would be the time to do so. All right, I'm on question 15. Let me reset my egg timer. Uh, under the Uniform Securities Act, all the following statements are true, except surety bonds are not required for investment advisors that do not have custody of customer securities. Now, as I mentioned, what I like to do is maybe put a T or an F next to this. And remember, I'm looking for something that's false. And that is true. And I'm looking for something that's false. Administrators may inspect an investment advisor's record held out of state without prior notice. That's true. You know, again, if time is of the essence, I can do that. Surety bonds are not required for investment advisors that exercise discretion over customer accounts. That is false. Administrators may require minimum financial advisor, advisors whether or not they have custody of securities. Yeah, they can do whatever they want if it's in the public interest. I'm joking, but you know, state administrators, you know, are typically attorneys and the state administrator typically is an attorney and this is a, uh, an, a ladder of office, so to speak. They plan on doing other things and what they don't make in private practice because they don't make it much in private, they make way more in private practice, but they don't make there, they get in power instead. So lots of power. So the answer to 15 is C, C. 
That's the point of the surety bond, by the way. And then remember, it's 10 or 35 grand, depending on, you know, do you have access to the customer's funds and securities? Uh, 16. Under the Uniform Securities Act, which of the following are cause, which of the following are cause for disciplinary review action by the state securities administrator? Uh, Joe files an application for registration as an investment advisor that, and omits the fact that he was convicted of fraud eight years ago. Yeah, that sounds, sounds like a problem. <laughs> Dude, Teresa, a registered investment advisor, failed to disclose she recently filed for bankruptcy. Now, bankruptcy does need to be disclosed, but it's not a reason for statutory disqualification, but it does need to be disclosed. Uh, three, the ABC Investment Advisory Group employs several representatives as independent contractors. No, all of us do. That doesn't require disciplinary review. I mean, that's how most of us work as independent contractors. Uh, four, FINRA has suspended Ed from conducting business in the securities industry for six months, indeed. So the answer is 16 is B as in boy, B as in boy, one, two, and four. Uh, 17. Under ERISA, under ERISA, ERISA stands for every ridiculous idea since Adam. No, it stands for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And a fiduciary, that's somebody who's you know in charge of this and making decisions on the behalf of the beneficiaries of the uh, retirement plan, must act in all the following ways except. So again, you got to be careful that it's except. They're asking us, uh, you know, what should we not be doing? So you know, the way I think of this is good or bad. So I'll just put good or bad. Maybe instead of T or F, I'll put good or bad next to these. Uh, solely in, in the interest of the plans, participants, and beneficiary. Yeah, that's what a fiduciary is. That sounds like that's a good thing. And yeah, remember, I'm looking for a bad thing. Uh, with care, skill, prudence, and diligence under the circumstances then prevailing that a prudent person acting in like capacity and familiar with such matters would use in the conduct of an enterprise of a like character. Yeah, that's the definition, by the way. That's the legal definition. If you go to my LinkedIn uh, profile, uh, I used to use, and it's still there on my Gama Global Investment Advisory, my firm, that we use Judge Putnam's de you know, de decision about prudency, what a prudent man or woman is, and uh, that definition can be found there. I used to use it in our marketing materials. Uh, C, in accordance with the governing plan documents, Unless they are not consistent with ERISA. Yeah, I mean, that means you should be doing the right thing and not anything that's inconsistent. Uh, confining investments only with those the most likely to achieve growth. Well, that doesn't sound like something a prudent man or woman would do. And so the answer to 17 is D as in dog. D as in dog. A client places a buy stop at 140. So buy 300 to get WQ at 140. So you're telling me that if this stock, I'll play broker, trades at or through 140, you want to buy it, but then you don't want to pay more than 144. So this is what we call a buy stop limit. If it was just a straight buy stop, there'd be not over 144, right? So, you know, a buy stop doesn't have that second qualifier there. So a buy stop would just have one qualifier. And so this is a buy stop limit. You can get two, three, four orders type of order kind of things. Again, the 66s of your recent seven shouldn't be challenged on that, but I did tell you, if you were challenged on this one over here, right? And you're challenged on this, maybe you wanna go back and you know, look at a narrative lecture on uh, types of orders. The answer is D as in dog, D as in dog. Let me clean up mine. Nineteen. A client owns treasury bonds and wishes to liquidate the position. The client receives a quote of 102, that's by the way, 1930 seconds. So that's the quote I get from a bond dealer. Remember a bond dealer is gonna charge a markdown. So I'm telling you that I'm willing as a bond dealer, bond desk to buy this into my inventory at 102.19. This represents a premium. This represents a premium. Well, the bond is trading at a premium, but that's not what they're asking about. They're not asking about the bond. They're asking about the quote, right? So this question isn't about that price. It's about the quote. So remember the customer, when he's selling, is going to get the bid price. The answer is C. 
I mean, it's a cleaner thing, right? I, if the customer were buying, it would be the ask. Now, again, if you are struggling with that, the answer here is C. If you're struggling with that, uh, maybe what you want to do is uh, I have a little short lecture called Know Your Bid from Your Ask. I think I put it in the 6560 playlist, but there's a nice little overview there for you uh, if you'd like. Um, to review that, or you can watch Trading Securities. I have a little narrative lecture on that as well. All right, number 20. A cust if your customer wish it wants to set aside $40,000 for when his child starts college, so it looks like what I need is a set sum of money, $40,000 at a future date. But I don't want to endanger the principal. You should recommend. Uh, this is very much a test question. I can't imagine you're not going to get tested on knowing that zero coupon bonds are a great uh, recommendation for somebody who needs to set some money at some future date. Now you're going to do straight line amortization upward called accretion, and you're going to owe taxes on that imputed interest. That's called phantom income. Uh, but uh, corporate bonds, no, because it said doesn't want to endanger the principal. And if it was a corporate bond with a high rate of interest, I uh, just reading today, Carvana is issuing bonds with a 10 and a quarter coupon. That's a junk bond, less than triple B, very testable. And this question says they don't want to have any danger of the principal. They're not willing to take credit risk is what that means in English. Municipal bonds, nah, there's nothing in the question about taxes. For muni bond to be the right answer, there's got to be something in the question about they're in a high tax bracket or something like that. And then common stock, no, no, you can lose your money. So the answer is A. Uh, I do think that's uh, definitely something you want to be uh, up, and up to speed on is zeros. When does a, what does a bond's yield to maturity indicate? Well, you know, most people who buy bonds, buy them and hold them to maturity. So what does that indicate? The annual interest they pay on the bond. No, let's just get out of thing. Probably should be able to, you know, know that that's not true. That's the nominal yield. That is the fixed or stated rate of return. That is the coupon. So that's not the right answer. The annual interest they pay on the bond relevance to its market price. Now, if we took the annual interest the issuer pays and divided by the market price, that would be current yield. You should definitely be able to do current yield on your exam. Uh, the annual interest rate the issuer pays on the bond relative to the annual dividend, that's just nonsensical. You know, they're just, they're good at making up things that are nonsensical, so that's, that's nothing. Uh, the annual into impact on the bond's market discount or premium. Yeah, if we buy the bond at a discount, we're going to make money by holding it over its remaining life. That's what yield of maturity is. Or if we pay a premium, it's going to be less. It'll be actually be yield to cost. So given that answer set, our best answer is D as in dog. D as in dog. Opening a margin account involves the submission of a number of documents, including a properly executed margin agreement. Under the North American Securities Administrator Association, every time I hear that, I'm just going to spell it out in my own mind. Every time I hear USA Uniform Securities Act. Under the NAS, uh, North American Securities Administrator Act, statement of policy on dishonest and unethical business practices of a broker dealer and its agents, those documents must, 22, be received prior to the initial trade in the account. Now, if this was the FINRA rule, that would be true, but this isn't the FINRA rule. This is the NASA rule. And it's one of those weird ones that is kind of different on the NASA side of the house than it is on the uh, security side of the house. And so the answer here is B. B is in boy, B is in boy. A little different than, than uh, you know, the other ones. Uh, that was 22, 23. If your 60 year old customer purchases a non-qualified variable annuity, and withdraws some of her funds before the contract is annuitized. What are the consequences? Now, the first thing to notice in the question is that she is over 59 and a half, right? So there doesn't seem to be any problem there because she's 60. So it looks like what she's gonna owe is ordinary income taxes, uh, earnings exceeding her basis. We don't know what she put in. That's her cost base, what she put in there. So the answer is A. Now, if she wasn't 59 and a half, then that would have been subject to that 10%. Uh, a 6% corporate bond, again, you, if you've been a test taker for a while, if you're brand new 65, again, if you are not familiar with how to use the teeter-totter to answer questions, uh, I would recommend that you go to, I know you're not surprised, a lecture I have called the teeter-totter. 
And it tells you how to use the teeter-totter to turn judgment questions into aim and shoot point and click questions. And so here it tells me that the nominal yield is six. And it tells me, let me get a different color, that the yield of maturity is 5.8. And so using our teeter-totter, again, this isn't a lecture, it's an explication. But what that should show me here is that this bond at 24 is trading at a premium. The bond is trading at a premium. So the answer 24 is B is in boy. Uh, 25, which of the following trades occur in the secondary market? The specialist designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange buying stock as a principal. Yes, all the transactions that take place on the New York Stock Exchange are secondary transactions. Secondary transactions is very important, means the previous owner is receiving the proceeds. All those together are called the secondary market. And so, indeed, uh, Roman numeral one. Roman numeral one is certainly part of the answer. Two. A corporate uh, bond syndicate selling new issues. No, no, no. New issue would be with the primary market. The primary market is where the issuer receives, well, I should say primary transactions or where the issuer receives the proceeds where the issuer receives the proceeds. That's the primary transactions. All that together is called the primary market. So uh, two is not, one is. So we need one without two one without two. So we have a 50-50 now. It's either uh, A or B. An agent buying unlisted securities for a client. An agent buying unlisted securities for a client, indeed. Insurance company buying corporate bonds from directly from another insurance company. So Prudential is buying bonds from MetLife. Again, those are secondary transactions because the issuer isn't receiving the money. The previous owner is. And so the answer is B. By the way, the other thing to know is that the state administrator is less concerned about secondary transactions than they are about uh, primary transactions. Uh, 26, which of the following investment management styles would you recommend to a risk adverse client who believes in the added value a professional stock selection can offer but is seeking long-term capital gains? So which of the following investment management styles would you re uh, recommend to a risk adverse client, a risk adverse client who believes in the added value professional stock selection, long-term capital gains? So uh, given this uh, thing, it says added value. So you can give her the index fund. The index fund would be the right answer if they said they are into the official mar market hypothesis. So we can toss that out because it says there is added value in stock selection. And so that's certainly not going to be the index fund. So we can toss that out. That would be appropriate for somebody who says, I don't believe there's added value. Uh, international index fund, we can toss that out again, because again, that means no added value. So small cap versus large cap, and it says risk adverse. So the large cap, right? Because large cap uh, companies can make major mistakes and still be around. So a large cap growth manager, that'd be like Google, Netflix, Apple, you know, uh, a portfolio kind of like that. So the answer to 26 is D is in dog. Uh, 27, when opening an account for a new customer, uh, broker dealers must maintain customer identification programs for the purpose of verifying the customer's identity. This is very testable. It means a picture ID and then in our written supervisory procedures, We've got to do, you know, have a process for closing accounts where we can't verify the identity. Very testable. This is D is in dog. D is in dog. Oh. An investment uh, investor twenty eight is pursuing an aggressive investment strategy. Which of the following purchases would be most suitable? So you should definitely know that beta as a measurement of a stock's volatility is compared to the market as a whole. And so if I'm saying that I'm aggressive, that means I'm willing to take or sustain or be a, you know, find higher volatility acceptably 
in uh, seeking higher returns. So AMF stock with a beta of one means that if the market goes up 10%, AMF goes 10, 10%. If the market goes down percent, AMF goes down 10%. Boring, I'm joking. But that's not aggressive to try and just get a market return. So that's not gonna be, aggressive means I'm gonna have something that moves. Seven means it's less volatile than the market, less volatile. That means in good times I don't make as much and in bad times I don't lose as much. But again, this guy says aggressive. That's not aggressive. Uh, looks like this is going to be our answer, right? The highest beta, 1.3. So if the market goes up 10%, this should go up 13%. Now, by the way, if GHI went up 15% instead of 13, how am I doing that? 10% times 1.3. The 15% to 2% would be what we call alpha. So alpha is the return in excess of the beta. But here it's beta. You should definitely know that beta is a measurement of a stock's volatility as compared to the market as a whole. Convertible bonds, nah. I mean, that's, you know, that's not aggressive. 29. An investor owns 300 shares of GHA Common at a cost of $40 a share. GHI is currently selling for $53.76. The investor is concerned about the current economic uh, conditions and doesn't hold a promising outlook. So let's just, in English, keep track of what's going on. So he's telling me that it looks like it's going to be going this way. And so, you know, hedging means I'm going to try and take the opposite market position, which in this case is going to be bearish. Concern the current economic, do not oppose but is reluctant to sell at this time. Which of the following positions would offer protection? Boy, Chuck being a jerk here. Protection, but the key word here, no cash outlay. Almost always, almost always, the answer here would have been to buy some puts. But remember, that means I'm going to have to pay the premium. And this says with no cash outlay. And so what I'm going to do here in question 30 is I'm going to, excuse me, question 29, I'm going to sell the covered calls to get some price, some price decline protection. So I would tell you, I'm not a big fan of this question because usually it would be buy a put for protection and sell for income. But the key thing here is we're looking for a bearish transaction and it no cash outlay, so we're gonna sell the covered call. Tough one, that one was tough. Again, you're not gonna get more than a handful of option questions. If you're 65 and you have no background in options, you should probably watch the option lectures, the first uh, two videos uh, I have on basics and then the hedging. A publicly traded corporation, this is very testable has filed for bankruptcy. In what order would the following interested parties be paid that receive payment? Very, very testable. You should definitely know the holders of secured debt come first. So that means it's either going to be A or B, right? Because I need Roman numeral one first. Uh, here, you should know the preferred stockholders come last in this answer set. So it's one at the beginning for a simple stock. Now I got to decide who should come next. The holders of subordinated ventures who knew they were buying bonds and capitalizing a business Right? If you buy those Carvana bonds at 10 and a quarter percent, you know you're capitalizing Carvana. Or the general creditors, that says people who are vendors to Carvana. Carvana's triple C, right? So if they default, it makes sense the general creditors should come ahead of your bond orders because the general creditors weren't capitalizing the business. And so the answer here, now on the test, you want to have to deal with gener general creditors. You'll have to deal with common, preferred, unsecured, secured, or secured, unsecured, preferred, common. So it'll be a little more straightforward on your exam, but you are going to encounter that. And so it's gonna be uh, one, two, three, or one, three, B is in boy, which is, let me just get my thing here, one, three, two, four. The general creditors are gonna come ahead of the uh, debenture holders. Thirty-one, which of the following statements uh, regarding dividends is true? A corporation is required, eh, corporations are not required to pay dividends. You know, what happens is the board meets quarterly and we go over our net income or earnings per share. And we as a board of directors say, okay, do we want to keep all of this as retained earnings or do we want to distribute a portion of our earnings as a dividend? So maybe we have a $4 in earnings per share. And I say, how much of the $4 do we want to distribute? And we might say, well, no, we need to build up the balance sheet. We got investments to make and uh, no dividend this quarter. Or we might say, you know what, let's pay half of it 
to our shareholders, we're giving them $2 as a dividend. So we had four, we gave them two, that's called a 50% dividend payout ratio. And that could be, you know, from zero to hundred, right? I mean, we don't need any of the money. Let's just pay it all out to the shareholders. But again, that's not something you have a right to and the board of the uh, company is not required to do that. A corporation is required to pay cash dividends. Nope. Dividends have a significant influence on the stock price. Ding, 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 ding. You should definitely know there's two potential test questions about this, two potential test questions. Let me get my annotation tool. You know, a lot of times they're not going to ask you to do any math. But when it comes to fundamental analysis, there are two things you should be aware of here as it relates to stocks that pay dividends. You know, uh, we like to do a net present value calculation of what the future series of dividends are going to be. So, for example, um, Berkshire Hathaway owns a billion shares of Bank of America. Bank of America pays an 84 cent annual dividend. And so what Mr. Buffett might decide is to say, OK, what do I think a good value is today for this future sets of dividends I'm going to receive? And based on that, decide what he wants to add to his position. You know, he had 700 million shares. Now he has a billion. So who knows? But that's called, very testable, the dividend discount model. And as we are asked in this question, does that have a significant influence on a stock's price? It certainly does. Uh, by the way, stocks that pay dividends are more uh, stable than stocks that do not. So that has a huge influence. You know, the only two ways you're going to make money from an investment is income stream and or price appreciation. So that does have a significant. So B is the answer. Now, uh, some companies grow the dividends. For example, Bank of America used to have an 18 cent quarterly dividend. Now it's 21 cents quarterly. And so we can justify a higher price if we assume that the uh, dividend will be a growing income stream. And again, I'm very rarely on the test. Am I going to actually make you do the math? I'm just going to ask you to recognize it. A growth company would be more likely to pay a cash dividend. Eh. No, no, exact opposite. In fact, you should be able to recognize uh, companies based on whether they do or do not pay a dividend. Uh, D, because of its priority, the dividend on company's preferred stock will always be higher than the dividends on its common stock. Eh, that's not true either. I mean, you know, the common, as long as I'm in, uh, you know, not in rears to my preferred stock, which I can pay as a, a bigger dividend than the preferred. I go neener, neener, neener. I'm joking, but you know. Uh, 32. Open and closed in fund companies, again, you're going to have to distinguish on the test between open and closed in investment companies. That's very testable. Uh, all the following in common except. So again, you're getting this thing about, can you distinguish between the two? Uh, they compute their net asset values. They certainly do. Uh, P.S. The closed end fund is the only one that would be trading at something less than its net asset value. But A is true. We typically do that once per business day. They actively manage their portfolios. That's true. They both have state investment objectives. That's true. Their shares trade in the secondary market. That's the accept, right? And accept means one of these things to not are not in common. And so the answer here is D is in dog. Very testable note, closed end funds do a trade in the secondary market, but open end funds do not. And so the answer 32 is D. D is in dog. Make sure test takers, you can distinguish between, uh, you know, those ones, 33. Uh, which of the following securities, securities issued by which of the following would be exempt from registration under the Uniform Securities Act? You should definitely know nonprofits are. Kind of a trick, by the way. It doesn't mean you can rip people off, right? So just because you're a nonprofit. It just means you don't have to make a registration statement. So that's true. Exchange-listed securities, indeed, are federally covered, so they don't need to register. Uh, federal savings loan have a different regulator and credit union. So the answer to that is D is in dog. 33, let me get out my annotation tool, is D is in dog. 34, if a firm uh, executes a customer order and discloses on confirmation, a commission and a markup, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't be a broker and a dealer in the same trade. Commission means I acted in my broker at the firm, acted in its broker agency capacity. And a markup means the firm acted in its dealer principal capacity. And I can't do both. I can either do one or the other, not both. The total of the two may not exceed 5%. Not true. The 5% is a policy, not a rule. And the difference between a policy and a rule is a policy is for the guidance of wise men and women. 
So I can charge people more than 5%. The firm is in violation of the trading rules, acting as both a principal and an agent in the same transaction. Ding, 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 ding. That's it. Test taking trick. You might want to take B because it's too long to be wrong. Now, remember, you don't use test taking tricks unless all else fails. <laughs> but when all else fails, one test taking trick is too long to be wrong. You know, uh, Chuck, you know, uh, really likes that answer because he's been a lot of time uh, writing. It. Please do not comment on this video that, you know, I told you just to pick the answer that's too long to be wrong. I'm offering you when all else fails. You don't whip out test taking tricks unless all else fails. 35. According uh, to the Investment Company Act of 1940, if an issuer is in the business of investing, reinvesting, trading, and owning and holding securities or intends on securities that exceed 40% of its assets, it is classified as an investment company. You know, some people accidentally end up being mutual funds, and you don't want to accidentally end up there because then you'll have to be subject to the Investment Company Act of 1940. So the answer is C. Uh, 36, the residual right of the shareholders refers to their right. That's very much a test question. So the answer to 36 is D. Now we have a, a calculation, the theoretical calculation of that, right? The theoretical liquidation, because we don't assume we're going to file bankruptcy. But if we're concerned about that, we might want to find out what is the book value. Book value represents the theoretical liquidation value of the corporation. So the answer is D. Uh, you do have a right to vote, but that's not what it's asking about. It's asking about the residual claim. You do have a right to examine the books, get quarterly and annual reports. That's not what it's asking about. You do have a right to dividends if declared. That's not what it's asking about. It's asking about the residual, right? And then again, it's like learning a foreign language. What do they say when you dream the foreign language? That's when you know it. So I guess when you have your first 65, 66 dream, you're on the right track. Uh, stock prices in the over-the-counter market are determined by, you should definitely be able to know this. You know, uh, maybe you want to annotate this one. And what I mean by that is you should definitely know the answer to 37 is uh, C. Whoop. But you should also know that uh, B is an exchange. So maybe we want to annotate that. And know that had they asked us about the New York Stock Exchange or any exchange, that would be an auction market. And so B is the right answer to the New York Stock Exchange. The answer to this one is C, over the counter. But if it was uh, asking about New York, it would have been B. So, uh, but by the way, even a better answer for New York, let me just fix this, would be this one is even better answer for the New York Stock Exchange is D as in dog. New York is a double auction. So I did kind of warn you about that. C is a better, D, Dean just looked at the answer set and said, ooh, D is even better, D is even better. Uh, 38, the answer 37 is C. Uh, an investor with a long position in a stock who then purchases a put. So that's pretty smart. Uh, you know, I recommend again, what Dean recommends isn't, you know, what you gotta do, but I always like when I have an option contract to just kind of put underneath what I'm looking at, that is a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. Okay, well, that is our timer going off. So we've been at it an hour now. So if you want to take a, uh, a break, now would be the time to do so. Uh, I'm gonna continue to march. I mean, you don't have to make it all the way through these. You can do your, take your break and come back and finish up. I'm gonna continue to march. So onward and upward. Uh, let's see, so. Uh, oh man, I raced my choice to sell. Uh, participate in additional gains of the securities and continues to increase in price. Yeah, I don't have to sell the stock if I don't want to. So the reason you buy a put is to have the ability to participate in a big price increase, Roman number one, uh, but not participate in a big price decrease, Roman numeral two, right? Because below the strike price, I'll just exercise that and protect a profit. Yeah, I mean, buying puts on stocks in the portfolio is a pretty smart thing to do for all of those reasons, for all of those reasons. So the answer to 38 is uh, D is in dog. And again, if you need to review options, I'm, not, I'm always torn about, particularly 65s, how much options work you wanna do for the questions are there. I mean, they're there, but if you tell me you missed the 65 because of options, I'm gonna say, eh, 66, 
again, the assumption there is that you just took a seven. And so you're probably a little more familiar with options. They're still there, but my assumption is that you're, you're probably a little more squared away with that. You are gonna get uh, questions on business structures. You are gonna get questions on business structures. So here, question 39. Which of the following statements is not true? Which of the following statements is not true? Members of an LLC are not personally liable for debts. That's true. You know, on the test, they sometimes will ask you why, would, there's a question about a husband and wife who have a partnership, uh, general partners, and why would the husband and wife wanna change the structure from general partnership to LLC? And it would be this reason. Is it an LLC? The managed members are not liable. Uh, limited partners actively manage investments. That is not true. In fact, you would not want to violate your limited partner status. So that is definitely false. A sole proprietorship account is for tax legal purposes. Yeah, the, the business and I are one and the same. That's true. You are going to get a question or two about business structures. An S corp is a form of corporation that's taxed as a partnership. Yeah, that's the whole point of the S corp is that there's a flow through. Uh, remember the uh, C corp is the one that doesn't have the flow through. So definitely make sure you, uh, you know the differences between these uh, C corp, uh, LLC, uh, a partnership, a sole provider is the easy one to form. You know, you're going to get a couple of questions on that. Uh, one method used by some analysts to estimate the future value of a stock is the dividend growth model. We just talked about this. This is testable. This probably would be most useful in the case of, in fact, I just gave you an example of that, right? Bank of America is what kind of a stock? I gave you the example of Bank of America and Warren Buffett. And remember, that was A, a large cap stock. Small cap stocks wouldn't have dividends and corporate bonds don't pay dividends and cumulative preferred, that's gonna be a fixed or stated dividend, it's not gonna grow. So you could use the dividend discount model on a preferred, but not the growth model because you're not getting anything beyond the stated thing, whether it's 4% or 5%, whatever it happens to be. Okay, well, as I told you, uh, I promised you in this uh, thing, 60 questions on 60s, the 60s, the 65 and 66. And so here are 20 more. We did 40. As I mentioned, these are uh, kudos or shout out to Kaplan. These are found in the QBank, but there are questions I use either before class. These are 20 questions I usually use before class. And the 40 we just finished are typically I do after class. And as I said, I understand on the channel how much you guys like practice questions. And so I'm just explicating these uh, practice questions for you. That'll be what, two practice finals. And I think there's another 70 questions there. There's 50. So we'll be up to, you know, almost three, 400 practice questions. All right. So let's look at uh, number one here, uh, which of the following is not required of a preliminary prospectus. You should definitely know that a preliminary prospectus is also known as red herring. You know, and then we're typically going to make our registration statement. We're going to enter into the cooling off period, which is a minimum of 20 days. And you should definitely know that the red herring does not have a final offering price. I uh, like number two, because number two is very similar. If a non-exempt issuer wants to register simultaneously with the state and the SEC, ding, 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 that's coordination. Now, every once in a while, somebody will struggle with this and say, well, what about New York or NASDAQ? No, those are secondary transactions. There is no secondary market at this point in time. It's a primary transaction. So we're going to register with the SEC and coordinate with any state administrator, any state that we want to sell our IPO in. So the answer number two is uh, B. Uh, number three. Oh, I forgot to turn over my egg timer. Uh, number three. Under which of the following circumstances does the SEC allow the investment advisor to charge performance-based fees? Uh, very important on the test to know that that gives me a greater incentives and puts you at greater risk if I'm getting performance-based fees and manage your money. You know, because it ain't my money that I'm risking. And it's both A and B. The client initially has to have a specified member, member of assets under management and a net worth or a net worth. And again, it's got to be reduced by gains and losses. The main question is, it gives your investment advisory firm an incentive to take greater risk with your capital. Uh, number four, 
Uh, which of the following statements regarding the anti-fraud provisions? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, no one and nothing is exempt from the anti-fraud provisions of uh, the Uniform Securities Act. Exempt securities are not subject? No. The only security? No. Three, no. Ding, ding, ding. You should definitely know just because it's an exempt transaction does not mean that you're exempt from uh, the fraud provisions. There's no one and nothing that's exempt from the anti-fraud provisions. Uh, by the way, that's 33.2, 33 and the Uniform Securities Act. So the answer there is D as in dog, D as in dog. Uh, which of the following securities are exempt from the registration disclosures of 33? You should not have been struggling with two and three. You should not have been struggling with two and three municipal bonds and U.S. government securities. So knowing that you need two and three, that means the only answer available to you that includes two and three. So, you know, some people don't like multiples. You're not going to get a whole lot of multiples on the test. But, you know, I kind of like multiples because multiples sometimes allow me to, you know, reverse engineer my answer by eliminating potential answers. I know I need an answer that has Roman numeral two municipal bonds are exempt from 33. You should definitely know that. And U.S. government securities are exempt, so I know I need two and three. I only have one answer that fits that, and it's D. Remember we said a railroad is a common contract carrier, different regulatory authority, commercial papers sold to money market fund managers who are capable of protecting their own assets, their own interests. So it's D as in dog. Number six. The Investment Advisors Act of 1940 requires delivery of a brochure delivery of a brochure containing information about the investment advisor's background and business practices in which of the following situations, in which of the following situations. The service provided is an individual supervisory service. Yeah, that's, that's what investment advisors are doing, right? I'm managing your money. I certainly need to give you the brochure. I don't have to give the brochure to an investment company because they're capable of protecting their own interests. So you should definitely know an investment company does not need to receive the brochure or form ADV part two because they, you know, they, they have a problem with me, they should be able to figure it out. Uh, the contract is for an impersonal advisory service requiring payment of less than 500. That 500 comes up a lot, right? So, you know, if it's less than 500 bucks, you know, big deal, you lose $499, I'm joking. But, you know, this would be like uh, my newsletter, you know, Dean Tenney's investment newsletter, I tell you securities to buy or sell. And I charge you $499.99. I don't have to get a brochure. Now, I like number four because remember, I told you this earlier. Don't get confused about this. That's an accredited investor. That has nothing to do with this question. All accredited investor means is that you can participate in a Reg D. It doesn't mean anything other than that. So if you're a doctor with a net worth of over a million, I still got to give you the brochure. So the answer here is B is in boy, one and four. Uh, seven, sometimes you can get questions right by covering up the screen and saying, are they asking about people and places or paper prospectuses? 33 is about paper and prospectuses. 34 is about people and places. So a number seven, a seven 34. Is uh, 34 about new offerings? It is not. New offerings is 33, prospectus, paper. So we can eliminate Roman numeral one. It did create the SEC. You know, and it does, uh, the SEC is definitely concerned with manipulation of the market. I'm coming to you today, and uh, they just announced a major criminal case, an SEC case uh, against a family office that was manipulating the market. And uh, yeah, they do uh, determine under 34, Reg T was given to the Federal Reserve Board, determine margin requirements. So it's two, three, and four. The answer is D as in dog. And 33 is prospectuses, paper. Uh, which of the long securities are exempt under the registration requirements of the Uniform Securities Act, an investment contract in connection with an employee pension plan that's exempt. Uh, nonprofits are exempt and the securities of St. Paul's Catholic Church, Tempe, Arizona is a charitable uh, entity. Uh, public utilities have a different regulatory authority, the Public Utilities Commission, they're exempt. And uh, only provincial governments of Canada are exempt. No other provincial governments. What we mean by that is, you know, uh, for test purposes, 
the uh, British Columbia is no different than the state of Nevada. And Vancouver, a city in British Columbia, is no different than Las Vegas is a city in Nevada. The Canadians are considered to be the equivalent. What I mean by that is it's called the North American Securities Administrator Association, right? So there's also a state administrator in British Columbia. A long story short, that isn't true of like um, Baja, California. Baja, California is not an exempt from uh, its securities from registration, only the federal government of Mexico is. So it's one, two, three, and four, and the answer is D as in dog. In which of the following circumstances is number, oh, I'm sorry, let me clean up here. Nine. Uh, which of the following persons would not be considered an investment advisor under the Investment Advisor Act of 1940? Which of the following is not? A person who advertises, remember the way we get this right, let me just get out my annotation tool again, is with what we call the ABC test. The ABC test. Do you give people investment advice? This is worth a lot of points on the test. Do you tell people you're in the business of giving investment advice? Do you give investment advice? Do you tell people you're in the business of giving investment advice and you want compensation? All right, so now let's use our ABC test. Uh, a, a person who advertises, they're in the business of providing, yeah, I, that's an investment advisory firm. By the way, remember person means not a physical, sometimes it, it's, persons don't mean all the time a physical, living, breathing human being watching planet Earth. The investment advisory firm and the broker dealers are persons. They're just unnatural persons, right? So uh, B, a person who provides investment advice to individual retirement plans, uh, compensated by them, that's an investment advisor. A teacher who explains investment programs to retirees on a voluntary basis. So again, no compensation. A teacher doesn't say she's he or she's in the business of doing this. Uh, you know, I get this right with what I call the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other. And so far, this teacher sounds like she's not like the others. Um, by the way, remember lawyers, accountants, teachers, teachers, engineers. An agent of a broker dealer, that would be somebody with a six or seven who also has a separate financial planning business. That doesn't matter. Financial planners, remember, under Investment Advisory 1092, IA 1092 release are investment advisors. So the answer is C, C. Uh, number 10, in which of the following circumstances is a person most likely to be considered an investment advisor? A pension consultant who bills by the hour for advice he provides on the merits of Pacific investment managers. Yeah, ABC, advice, business, compensation. Now be careful on B. If all I do is negotiate your contract as a agent, and then I tell you to put it into a trust department, that's not an investment advisor. The advice I gave you was incidental. I'm not actually managing the money. So B is not an investment advisor. Uh, a financial planner who gives general investment advice not related to securities. What's that? That's an insurance agent. That's a non-securities product. So financial planner uses insurance and then offers discounts to clients who subscribe to a newsletter published on fly fishing. Again, uh, giving investment advice, but not related to securities is the key point there. And a teacher who gives better grades. Yeah, given that answer set, looks like our answer is A. A. You know, that's the one that, that looks different, right? Looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. 11, uh, which of the following must an investment advisor representative consider before recommending a municipal security? That's very testable. I can't imagine on either 65 or 66, you're not gonna get questions about suitability about muni bonds. I would warn you, you need to be able to do tax and tax-free equivalent calculations. I have a whole separate lecture on it. You need to be able to do it. So if you can't do that, Make sure you uh, can do it before you test. This question is just about suitability, which is D, right? All the above. You need to know your state of residence, your tax status, and I certainly should know whether I'm recommending what kind of quality I'm recommending. Twelve. 
12, all the following statements regarding government agency securities are true, except I'm looking for something that's false, something that's false. Uh, they may be backed by the federal government. Well, that's true, right? Ginny Mae is and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not. So A sounds pretty mellow. That sounds true. They're considered riskier. Eh, no, 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 no. They either have the direct backing or implied backing. So they're certainly not riskier than corporate securities. The answer, remember, is except. So it's B. They are fully taxable. Yes. They're authorized by Congress. Yes. They are government-sponsored enterprise. The answer number 12 is B. A corporation calls in its debts when interest rates are. So remember, the call allows the uh, issuer, the corporation, to replace high cost debt with lower cost debt. And so that's the risk you have when interest rates are declining. Interest on a California GO bond purchased by a resident of San Francisco. California could tax you, but chooses not to, to give you an incentive to invest in California. So that's going to be exempt on both the state and the federal level. Now, that would be the same with territories, the United States government. I'd be you know, prepared to get two, three, four questions on uh, muni bonds. The answer is D is in dog. 15, very much a test question. An investor is in a 25% marginal income tax bracket. Who cares? Owns a municipal home with an 8% coupon. We care. The consumer price index is 3%. We care. What's the investor's inflation adjusted after tax return? This is called constant dollars. It's very testable. So all you do here is take the 8% coupon minus three, and you tell me that that is going to be after inflation or inflation adjusted, a 5% return. Very much it's something you're gonna to have to do on the exam. Uh, which of the following are not considered? By the way, if you're worried about inflation, I would know about keeping pace with inflation, maybe a tip. And I would know if you wanna beat inflation, common stocks. Uh, which of the following are not considered money market instruments? You should definitely know the commercial paper and corporate bonds are. And so that means ADRs and corporate bonds are not. And remember it's asking me which is not. And so the answer to 16 is A is an apple. A is an apple, one and three. Uh, that was 16, 17. Uh, which of the following has least exposure to inflation risk? I like this. You're going to get some version of this. So least exposure. I just told you they're looking for here common stock. And that very much is going to be something that shows up. You know, if you go into McDonald's and look at the menu, uh, those menu prices are very easy to change. And so what McDonald's is going to do is pass through the inflation to the consumer. And so in common stock, you're more likely to be able to keep pace or beat inflation with common stocks, right? Because that inflationary uh, process is passed through to consumers in the form of common stock. You're not going to do that in a fixed income investment vehicle like A or in D, fixed where your payments are fixed and cash is going to lose its value, right? Our last inflation rate was close to 8%. So if you had $10,000 in cash, you now have 9,200 in purchasing power. If an elderly widow with no independent income other than Social Security wishes to invest the proceeds of her recently deceased husband's life insurance, which of the following would be the most suitable recommendation? And uh, nothing in here about taxes. Remember, for tax, for me, you need to be right. This has to have something about a tax bracket or high tax bracket. So without that, you can kind of toss that out. We certainly shouldn't do an oil, gas, wildcat program. And we certainly shouldn't do options. So it looks like what I'm left with is we buy some high quality dividend paying preferred stocks. Perhaps it looks like the remaining answer for that one. The answer is A is an atom. Uh, the statistical measurement that indicates how much an investment returns have fluctuated compared to its average return or given period of time. Now, I like this question. This is very reflective. I'm not asking you to do math, but you should have been able to kind of, even if you don't, don't freak out, you take a deep breath and you say, well, I know it's not beta because for it to be beta, there's got to be something about the market, you know, compared to the market. So I know it ain't that. There's no such thing as R squared. And convexity is the nonlinear return of volatility in bonds. So convexity would have something to do with bonds, not this. So by process of elimination, I get standard deviation. By the way, I think that's actually 
a good flashcard, standard deviation on one side, and then the definition on the other. Very rarely do you have to do that. I just did three debriefs this week. One guy had to use his calculator once. I think people are more fearful of the math than they should be as it relates to that. Now, if you're fearful of math on 65, 66, if you go to your playlist, I have a lecture called Analytical Tools that goes through all the math. And I also have uh, 50 questions that are just the math questions. So you can you know, practice your skills if you'd like. To assess the performance of small cap, very testable to know which is the appropriate thing for benchmarking. So Russell 2000 for small cap is D as in dog. The S&P 500 would be for large cap, large cap stock fund. That's testable, C. And I would also the one know the one that's not in the answer set is Wilshire 5000, which reflects the total stock market. Okay, so that was the 60 questions I promised you. Please do not call and ask me to send you a PDF. I am not geared to doing that. There are no PDFs, unless it's Test Geek. If you're on the channel, you see a Test Geek, then you can call, uh, go to Brian's website. There's a link and you can get it for $16. Uh, not so of anything else I have on the channel. There are no PDFs. Maybe next year there'll be a channel. Uh, shout out to Kaplan. That's part of why Kaplan gives me permission to give you free looks on Kaplan QBank questions. And this comes from the class notebook. So you know, can sign up for class and you get a copy of the class notebook that includes the questions we just went over. So um, anyways, uh, good luck. Uh, this will be uh, Tuesday. We do our weekly community live stream. And typically before the live stream is when we premiere new content. And so I'm going to put this uh, in Tuesday content, uh, you know, uh, upload just before our, our live uh, community uh, thing. So uh, <laughs> Uh, let me know if you uh, like the continuing uh, adding of these questions. I write some of them. Brian writes some of them. Kaplan lets us use some of them. But with that mix, you know, we're able to provide you with like a, a lot of performance opportunities. That's what I call practice questions. So uh, you could demonstrate your prowess or lack thereof before you actually go to the exam. I'll see you for our next installment uh, whenever that happens to be.